is a soft-spoken 49-year-old native of South Boston. But don't be fooled by the low-key, matter-of-fact way he answers questions about his life of crime. You seem to have committed every crime in the book. Let me know if I've got all of this right. You beat people up? Yes. Put them in the hospital? Yes. Shot, stab people? Yes. Help kidnap people? Yes. And you were an accessory to murders? Correct. That's a, that's quite a resume. It's the business we were in. The business they were in was organized crime. And what set Whitey Bulger's organization apart was its penchant for violence. Weeks says it was all part of the folklore of this Irish working class neighborhood known as Southie. Was it a tough neighborhood when you were growing up, Kevin? You had a fight. You didn't have to win, but you had a fight. On these streets, Whitey Bulger was known as a vicious gangster who never hesitated to use violence. Weeks, who had a reputation as a tenacious street fighter, caught the crime boss's eye while he was working as a bouncer at a local bar. Over the years, he became Bulger's most trusted confidant. What did you do for him? What was your job? Anything he asked me to do. Including murder. For 20 years, Weeks was with the crime boss nearly every day but they were exceedingly careful. This is one of only two known photographs of them together. It was taken at a park called Castle Island where they talked business out of earshot of police bugs. Weeks says the man he called Jimmy was a criminal mastermind. 98% of, of uh, his waking hours was dedicated to crime, 2% to pleasure. He was very disciplined, had no bad habits. He didn't drink, he didn't gamble, didn't do drugs. No bad habits if you don't count murder. And it was something Weeks says Whitey thoroughly enjoyed. How did he kill people? Oh, he, I mean, he stabbed people, he beat people with bats, he shot people, he strangled people, run them over cars. You, you saw, said also that he liked killing. Yeah. Well, explain that to me. After he would kill somebody, he'd, it was like a stress relief. You know, he'd be uh, nice and calm for a couple of weeks afterwards. Like he just got rid of all his stress. By killing? Yes. Well, that's a bizarre way to get rid of stress. Weeks told us he helped Bulger commit three murders in this house. He lured the victims there, stood guard over them while they were interrogated, and after they were killed, he buried them in the basement. One of the victims was a gun runner named John McIntyre, who was cooperating with police. John McIntyre was originally strangled, but the rope was too thick, so um, he was gagging. So uh, Jimmy shot him in the head, and then uh, he pulled his teeth, and we buried him. Pulled his teeth? Yes. Why? Um, back then, there was uh, dental records. There was no DNA. So that was to prevent people from being... Uh, Identified. No regrets about the loss of life you're responsible for? No. If he has any regrets, it's about one person he didn't kill. Howie Carr is a columnist for the Boston Herald as well as a radio talk show host who has been a thorn in the side of Whitey Bulger and his gang for 20 years. Whitey Bulger is a uh, serial killer, cocaine dealer, bank robber, pedophile, very smart criminal. Did you consider him a worthy adversary? I mean, is that why you went after him so hard? I went after Whitey just because I, I couldn't believe he was getting away with, with what he was doing and that nobody would write about it. So perhaps it's no surprise that Bulger and Weeks hatched a plan to take Howie Carr out of the newspaper and off the airways for good. We found out he lived down in Acton, Massachusetts. We drove down his house, and we took pictures, we scoped it out, we looked for an escape route. Um, we had one plan, we were gonna fill a basketball with C4. Plastic explosive. Correct. And when he came out of the house, we were going to blow it up and kill him. But <clears throat> we decided that uh, we'd probably take the house down, too, and kill some innocent people, his family. So we nixed that plan. Plan B, he says, was much more direct. Weeks was just going to shoot him. I was down his house one morning, about 5.30 in the morning, across the street in the cemetery with a rifle, waiting for him to come out. And uh, he came out about... Uh, between 7.15, 7.30, and uh, he had his daughter with him. I assume it was his daughter, a young girl. He's holding her by the hand, going to his car. So I had a pass on it, and then... Uh, Why'd you have to pass? Yeah, I didn't want to kill him in front of his daughter. 
You had him in your sights? Yeah. So if he had come out the door by himself, he'd be a dead man? Yeah. Your reaction to that? I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if I believe him or not. And he says he was in the graveyard. Is the graveyard across the street from yeah, your house? Yeah, there is. He said he was in the graveyard and had you in the scope. He had you in his sights. It just doesn't seem like Kevin would have the stones to do it. I mean, I could see if he said Whitey was there, well, you wouldn't be interviewing me because I'd be dead. But I'm just not sure Weeks is capable of that. He doesn't believe your story. Mm. He also said you didn't have the stones to kill him. Really? Well, I don't think Howie Carr has the stones to confront any man and say what he prints to their face. What would you say to Howie Carr if he were here? I wouldn't say anything to Howie Carr. He could tell me what he thinks of me, and I'll show him what I think of him. And how would you do that, Kevin? Uh, I think I'd be creative. I could figure something out. Creative? What does that mean? Whatever comes to mind at the time. I, I, I would assume after the time you've spent in jail, you're not going to kill him. No, but, you know, it's a loaded question. You could say yes or no. Well, I don't like him. For 20 years, Weeks and Bulger were practically untouchable. One reason, he says, was that they had six FBI agents and dozens of Boston cops on the payroll. Every time we made a score, say there was four of us involved in the score, uh, it would be cut up five ways, and their fifth piece would go to law enforcement, to the connections. And uh, we were always getting information back about investigations that were going on, things people were doing, saying about us, grand juries, things like that. From law enforcement. From law enforcement. Bulger even used tips from an FBI agent named John Connolly to identify and kill informants within his own organization. Connolly is charged with murder in connection with his ties to Bulger's gang. With help like that, they amass tens of millions of dollars from gambling, drugs, robberies, and extortions. Once Bulger and Weeks even hit the Massachusetts State Lottery, winning $14.7 million, although many suspect they simply coerced the winning ticket holder into having them as partners. Then, in a flash, their luck ran out. It was two days before Christmas of 1994 when a tip from a crooked FBI agent marked the beginning of the end for South Boston's Irish mob. That was the day Whitey Bulger found out he was about to be arrested and charged with extortion and racketeering. Week says Bulger knew he had been under investigation, but no one knew how much planning he had done to be ready for this day. Since the early 80s, he had been creating new identities and stashing millions of dollars in safety deposit boxes around the world. He's probably worth uh, 30 to 50 million dollars. 50 million dollars? Yeah. So he could live a long time yeah. on that. Comfortably. Weeks was one of the few people Bulger trusted enough to stay in touch. He says he was able to meet face to face with the most wanted man in America five times over the next two years in Boston, Chicago, and New York delivering forged identifications and keeping him abreast of developments back home. He says the meetings were always arranged by phone. We had cold words for different places. Uh, when he wanted me to go to New York, he'd tell me he'd meet me at the uh, Lions. Where was that? It was the public library. It had two big lines out front. Bulger told him big cities allowed him to hide in plain sight. One time, Whitey asked directions from a New York City cop. He walked up to him, and uh, he was looking for a street a restaurant, and he asked the cop for directions. And uh, I couldn't believe it. I'm just looking at him. <laughs> this guy's wanted. He just gave him directions and stuff. He thanked him. We walked away. Weeks says the last time he saw Bulger was in New York in 1996, almost two years after he vanished. He says what he told him he'd be in touch, but he never called again. A few months later, there was this bombshell reports that Whitey Bulger had been a top-level FBI informant since 1975. Bulger, who'd killed anyone he thought was an informant, had all along been giving the feds information about rival criminals as well as some members of his own gang. Weeks, who was still a player in the Boston underworld, was shattered. He betrayed me. 
betrayed me the whole time. He betrayed all of us. T tell me how he betrayed all of you. Well, we knew we were paying for information, that we had sources in law enforcement. So as far as we were concerned, the relationship was one way. We were receiving information. We were paying for the information. Now we find out he's given information. So he was giving up some of his own people. He was giving up some of his own people. He was giving up the competition. He was, I mean, he was, basically he um, made a deal with the FBI. They gave him carte blanche to do what he wanted. Weeks turn to make a deal came in 1999 when he was arrested and charged with 29 crimes. Facing life in prison and abandoned by his boss, he decided to cooperate. So what did you do? We made a deal to uh, sit down and talk. Uh, they wanted proof that I was telling the truth. So uh, I led them to three bodies. For years, Whitey Bulger's victims had simply disappeared, and police could never make a murder charge against him stick. Weeks literally knew where the bodies were buried, and he eventually led them to six of them. When it was all over, prosecutors were able to charge Bulger with 20 additional counts of murder. In return for his cooperation, Weeks spent just 72 months in prison. He was released last year. A lot of people, particularly the families of the victims, have been outraged. I mean, they look at it and said, we lost a loved one, and this guy's walking out on the street. They're entitled to their feelings. I mean, uh, if someone killed a loved one of mine, I'd want to kill them. I wouldn't want them in jail. I'd want to kill them. So they're entitled to, uh, you know, and they're probably correct. Week says he isn't worried about his safety. He's refused the witness protection program and is already back in Southie, where he says people now know the reality behind the myth of Whitey Bulger. We were supposed to live by a certain code. And this was his teaching, too. You know, you never ride on your friends, never ride on your family. You never give everyone up. You have a problem, you take it to the street. You have any idea where he is today? Um, a definitive idea? No. I mean, I, I believe he's probably over in Europe somewhere. I believe he went over to uh, Europe, and I think he got trapped over there after 9-11. And couldn't come back. Correct. The federal task force assigned to capture Bulger says the last confirmed sighting of him was in London in 2002. Last week, the task force released this 26-year-old surveillance tape of Whitey Bulger in hopes that someone might recognize his walk or mannerisms.